So, hi guys, my name is Alexander. Um, I need a clicker. Uh, I'm not used to going back to the computer. Anyways, um, hardware revolution, uh, what is it? it? It's also known as, uh, already Gert mentioned before, Internet of Things, but also, so, so it's, a, it's a kind of uh, a child which has many, many names. Also, maker movement. Um, we had makers on a stage before, so they call themselves makers. Uh, hardware renaissance, or new coming of the hardware revolution. So this thing has very many names, but, but what is it actually? So if we look at like these two numbers on, on this very, very beautiful um, picture, which is um, done by, by Upwerter, which is a, a hardware startup, um, there was 55% more hardware startups created in, in US in 2013 compared to 2012, and 117% more funding went into early stage hardware companies. In one year, 117% growth just in 12 months. And this is quite amazing, and, and this is why they call it uh, the revolution. So if we look where it all started, so we have seen today a lot of uh, platforms, so they think it started with Arduino. So what, what makes Arduino so special? Arduino kind of commoditized the hardware. Uh, and, and as we already s heard on s stage, that means that everybody has access. Not only money-wise, but also really, literally, you can go online, order a component, and you have it in the next day. It used to take a lot of time to get the components. So hardware got commoditized. Also Arduino, what it did, it, it made programming hardware so much easier. So now we see a lot of software guys moving into hardware scene because they know how to program the hardware. When I went to school, I still learned assembler, so I know how to program assembler, I know how to program C, I know how to program C++. But nowadays you don't need all that because if you take Arduino, it's like writing JavaScript. It's, it's quite easy. Now the next thing what happened was MakerBot and 3D printing, which has kind of made it so much easier to produce your own casings, for example, or really first physical products. But at the same time, an interesting thing happened that many factories started working with smaller companies. So I visited a couple of factories in Taiwan and China. An example is Quanta. It's one of the biggest manufacturers in Taiwan. They have 100,000 employees. And together with me, there was 35 other hardware startups from all over the world. One of them also our investment. And the speech to these 35 startups who don't have money was given by vice president of the company. This guy has 100,000 employees and he comes to talk to the startups. So that kind of gives you an, an idea where also the manufacturers are moving. They are also moving towards startups, although usually they don't have large orders, but this is where the future is. And it used to be, they didn't even talk to you if your order was less than 100,000 pieces, right? So the next thing is Fitbit, is a good example of uh, how smartphones revolutionized uh, using hardware. So Fitbit is a device which is actually, you can call it a glorified pedometer, so it just counts your steps, right? But what makes Fitbit special is it doesn't have any screen, if you notice, it's actually a fairly stupid device. Just like Teet was telling that, that these tags are stupid, but all the smartness is in your phone. So that makes it now possible to create all kinds of devices which doesn't have screens, which makes it possible to run a very long time on a battery. You don't have to put a lot of processing power in a device. You just have to have some like smartness, few sensors, and the connectivity, and that's it. And when you speak about the connectivity, it's, uh, there's electric imp exactly where in the middle of here, electric imp. So electric imp is a good example how easy it is now to connect hardware into internet. So whatever you build, it's fairly easy to put it online. Used to, you had to know TCP IP stack, um, we, which is not easy to program if you have to do it from the scratch. Now electric imp is just a SD card. You plug it into a Raspberry Pi, and this thing is in online. So it's easy as that, really. So connectivity has also gone much easier compared to a few years ago. It's not even 10 years ago, only a few years, years ago. And of course, the Kickstarter. Kickstarter kind of has de-risked the product launch. So it gives early 
feedback on the market whether actually your product has some chance or not. So if you fail on Kickstarter, it really depends. Kickstarter is a tricky thing, but we're coming back on that later. So if we now look at where we are today, we're still in the early adapter stage. Like Gert asked before, how many of you are a, have, have a wearable device with you, like a quantified self device? Only very, very few hands raised. So that means that potential is huge in terms of mar market growth, right? It's still early adapters, it's geeks, engineers, um, highly paid individuals who buy this stuff, right? And as we saw with smartphones, there is going to be a point of time where there's no other way. And this is why we invest currently into hardware, because we think there's growth ahead of us. I really do hope that we're right. So this is the number which, on different slides, you see different uh, numbers. I think Gert said 60 billion today. Uh, yesterday I saw at, at Slush, I saw 50 billion. Um, on this slide it says 80 billion. But the idea is that, that in 10 years time we have a lot of devices connected to the internet. Which means, again, that if it's 80 billion devices, it's 10 per human being. And that's a lot. Today, this number is about... I think 20 times smaller. So in 10 years, 20 times growth. Think about it. And by 2025, um, we expect, or they expect, to have about 100 more Apple-like companies. So Apple is the most valuable hardware company in the world, number one in value. There's no other competitors. By 2025, hopefully there's 100. Hopefully one of them is our portfolio company. I really hope. So. If we now come to the Kickstarter, who, who knows where this picture came from? Anybody? Okay, few of you guys. Okay, so it's it's a very very uh, popular show about the Silicon Valley. Now, if you think about Kickstarter, this is who your customer is. These are the guys who are on the Kickstarter. We're like I said, we're geeks, we're highly paid engineers, we are early adapters. So now. If you launch your product on the Kickstarter and come to talk to me as an investor and say, okay, hey, I had 2,000 customers who bought on Kickstarter. Will you invest a couple of hundred thousand euros in me because we are a huge success? I say no, and what, you know why? Because if you, if you ask most of the hardware companies, what is your target market? They say North America, right? Do you know what the North America looks like in average? So, so if you want to put your product on a Walmart or Home Depot, this is your customer. I, I'm not making this up. You can just Google it. These pictures are from Google. If you type in Walmart customer, right? So n now you kind of get the point. Uh, that the fact that you have a success successful Kickstarter campaign doesn't show anything if your customer is these people. It's a not well-known fact is, for example, that Fitbit customer is actually a 40-year-old overweight woman who has 2.5 kids in North America. It's, it's not you guys. And they have reached their market, but they didn't go to the Kickstarter, right? So, so you kind of have to think about it. Um, so my name is Alexander Tonison. I'm, I'm a co-founder and CEO at Build It Hardware Accelerator. I actually have a corporate background. So I, I used to work and live in Germany building flight simulators when for some reason moved back. Um, started my own engineering company, uh, gathered a little bit of money, and, and then started a hardware accelerator. Today I've in invested into 15 hardware companies, and we're going to make another 10 investment in next year, by next year March. So what is a startup accelerator? I, I, I still have to put that slide usually up because not very many people know, and I also think that Today in this room, that's not our usual target audience. So Startup Accelerator basically is a way of investing into companies. You, gave, you give them a little bit of money, 20,000 euros. So, so we give them 20,000 euros so that they wouldn't have to starve. It turns out that if, even if you're a startup builder, you still want to eat, funny enough. Um, and you bring them together in one, one place and you put them through a mentoring program. So the main value add in any accelerator in the world is in the mentors. So you give them advice, and you kind of help them uh, see if there's a product market fit. It's quite common that startups 
fail during the accelerator or they pivot or they go out of business, that's fine. Because startup accelerators go in as investors in a very, very early stage. No other investors do. I mean, there are investors who do that, but they are your friends, they are your family, and they're fools. So, it's interesting that um, Paul Graham, who is the founder of Y Combinator, so Y Combinator is the first accelerator in the world, founded in 2005, and the most successful one. So Y Combinator invested into Airbnb and Dropbox, both multi-billion dollar companies, right? So Y Combinator n has never invested into hardware before 2013. So the last year we made first hardware investments. And this is the tweet from Paul Graham, which s says that in 2013 they selected three most likely companies to succeed from their batch. Y Combinator has large batches, so they have about 80 investments at once, so they invest into 80 companies once. And two companies out of these top three were hardware companies, which kind of shows w even that the accelerators who have stayed away from the hardware till now are now moving into the scene, right? Now, if you think about the accelerator, I, I said like, main value add is in the program. So this is what our program looks like. It's not that important. I'm just kind of trying to make a point that uh, the accelerator tries to condense about one or one and a half years into three months. It's not always possible, but the idea is that you try to push the companies so fast through your program that they kind of go through the process which they would otherwise have taken 12 to 18 months. So that's the idea. And that's why very many fa fail. And that's, that's okay. So we, for example, have, we have a business track and we have technology track. Technology track is all about product development. Business track is about thinking what is your product, uh, who is your customer, what is your market, what is your go-to-market strategy. Now, if you think about um, starting your own company, uh, maybe joining an accelerator, what I recommend you to do is go and look who their mentors are. So we are, of course, not the only accelerator in the world. But if you think about maybe joining one, go and look who their mentors are. Because this is the people you're going to work with. So this is just a sele selection of the mentors who we have. So for example, Hardy from Crap Guys. He's a really great guy, uh, knows the market, uh, went to US. Uh, Hardy is, by the way, Crap Guys is more well known in US as an Estonian company than Skype. In US, if you say that Skype comes from Estonia, nobody knows it. If you say, oh, do you know Crap Guys? Yeah, yeah, of course, Hardy. And that's just unbelievable. That this guy, in two years, been everywhere. He's been everywhere in the US, from Silicon Valley to Boston. So, so if you try to join an accelerator, go and look who the mentors are. So this is what the Europe looks like in 2013. We don't have the data for 2014 yet. This is the all accelerators in Europe. Um, the size of the circle shows how many investments they have made. And now if you see Tallinn, for example, so Estonia, is one of the, if not number one in Europe, um, if you count investments into startups per capita. And that also shows, kind of proves the fact that uh, the Tallinn, I think that, that was 44 investments by the end of 2014 into early stage hardware, com uh, sorry, not hardware companies. And if you compare, there's like not, not so many other spots which is as huge as Tallinn. So only Paris, Berlin, uh, UK and also in Bulgaria. Sofia is another kind of uh, interesting place uh, because they have five accelerators in, in, in there. Now if you think about hardware, sorry, hardware companies, so this is where, where the hardware accelerators are. Uh, there's currently four in Europe and actually Berlin is kind of cheating because they, they're not giving you any money. So they call, they call themselves the Berlin Hardware Accelerator, but they're not. But I just I put them on, this, on, on the map because they're very good friends of ours. Um, yeah, okay, so um, what are we looking for? And, and that applies to most of the accelerators. Since the program is very short, it's three months, sometimes it's four. Sometimes it's exactly 111 days because visas are issued for 111 days. Most of the accelerators look for products with high speed to market. The idea is that you have to have enough time in these three months to show some traction, right? So your product has to be able to be on the market in 
fairly sh short time. So what do investors look like? Uh, look, what do they look for? They look for the team. So if you go in at such an early stage, that means it's all about the team. Does the team have the relevant skills? Do they have the relevant experience? I mean, just the fact that uh, you're a hardware engineer and you know how to program Arduino doesn't mean that you're a great entrepreneur. So we look at the relevant experience, and one which is a key factor very often is that has this team worked together before? Because if I'm giving them 20,000 euro, which is my money, I want to make sure that this team doesn't break up during the process, right? So it's a very important key factor. If you want to start the startup, start it with somebody you know. Prototype is something working, quite important. In such an early stage, less important than a team. Because very many uh, teams pivot. Uh, Heimdaller is one of our investments, by the way. Um, and like, like Gert said, they pivoted. They started with tracking bicycles, turned out to be impossible, so they pivoted into a, another product. So product is not that important. Is there a market? Of course. So um, sometimes the fact that there's many competitors is actually good because that shows that there's a market. But at that point, you have to show that you're doing something differently. You're doing something better. There's an invest I mean, usually it's, it's not that um, strict, but some of the investors says, say that they only invest if you do something 10 times better and 10 times cheaper than your competitors. This is when they, they, they go in. This is typical venture capital. Um, and who else is considering investing? This is very important from looking from investor perspective. Is somebody else putting their money in? Or am I the only sucker? Um, a, a investor lately, it was very interesting that he said that the whole startup investment uh, scene is based on the theory of bigger fool, which means that every investor when he invests, he hopes that in the future he can find a bigger fool who will invest in more money. So it's kind of true. Uh, not, not that investors are not smart, but the idea is that we always kind of trying to think whether somebody else is also willing to put money into that company. If not, uh, it's not a good investment. And that goes to, together with the last point, is this team able to raise the next round? Super important. Every investor wants to exit your company one day. Every investor. Because investors are there to make money, right? So um, they look for exit. And that's why we're kind of trying to evaluate whether these are the guys who will go and raise another round. We have set a limit, or not a limit, we have set the goal, or we're kind of trying to evaluate that whether they're going to raise one million or not. There's a hardware accelerator in Boston called Bolt, one of the best ones in the world. They try to evalu evaluate whether you raise 100 millions or not. If they think that this is not the guy who's going to raise 100 million, we're not going to invest. So that's quite important. And the valuation. So valuation in, in, in investment world means that uh, how much is the value of the company by the time you put in the money. Of course, if the team is, they have no traction, they have no product, how in the hell should you kind of know what the company is valued at? So the valuation is a typical deal breaker. Startups tend to think that their companies valued um, well, whatever, one million euros, for example. Investors tend to think that it's valued four times less. So it's, uh, it's a matter of negotiations, whether you can somehow meet in the middle or not. But valuation is super important, looking from your perspective as a startup founder or from our perspective as an investor. So we, we typically invest at valuations of 500K, and we don't go higher. So now, if you think about the hardware company, so I guess most of you have software background, but building a hardware company is not easy. So if, if you're a founder who has software background, thinking of going to the hardware, if you can do your business without building hardware, do your business without building hardware. Um, which doesn't mean that if you come up with a great idea, you shouldn't do it. This is kind of few, not all of them, few key words which you need to understand if you're a hardware startup founder. If you find any words on this slide which you do not know, maybe you shouldn't start. 
or maybe you should like learn a little bit before you start. So for example, um, bill of materials, right? Shows how much your components cost. Or Gerber files, or CAD files. Designed to manufacture, it turns out, and this is what Teet was refer referring to, is if you build your first prototype, there's a quote from uh, one of the co-founders at Accelerator, which is a hardware accelerator in China, and he says that n no startups will survive a contact with a factory. And that means that uh, if you go with your prototype to a factory, it's 99% sure that what you came up is not manufacturable. And not because of the fact that technology is not able to do that, it's because of the fact that every factory has different capabilities. So if you choose a factory, you're going to have to make compromises every single time. So design to manufacture is, is very important. It takes time, only comes with the cooperation with a factory. Another great thing is China effect. And that can mean so many things. Uh, they say that if you want to manufacture in China, you have to go and sleep six weeks, six weeks, six months at the factory floor. So, so this is the kind of what I was saying, that it, it only happens through cooperation with, with the factory. Chinese are a different type of people. They think differently. I mean, they inherently think differently than Europeans. That also means for them, copying is okay. China effect could also mean that if you send them design, your product is on the Chinese market before you get your first prototype. Also happens very often. So you kind of have to think about it. You have to think about logistics. So if, if you're a software company, doing an update is very easy, right? You just push it to the cloud and that's it. Um, for example, if you screw something up in your hardware product, imagine the logistics nightmare it's going to be to get these products back to replace a component and send them back to the customers. So you kind of have to take that into consider consideration. Now, if we look at the software company, this is the topics which software company only has to think about. And now you see why not so many investors uh, like the hardware scene. Let's go back. Hardware, software, hardware, software. Yeah, and uh, there's very many venture capitalists who say they do not invest into software. And that's uh, so hardware, and that's the reason why. There's so many unknowns, but also, like in any investment, high risk means high gain. So if you pick the team who can actually do it, there's a huge potential for growth. Unlike for software companies where the competition is super high. Do you know how many apps are on the App Store? So, what we see in the hardware scene is also we see new business models kind of like emerging. So for example, if we start with hardware as service. So everybody knows that there's a software as service um, type of businesses. So hardware as service is something similar. So you're actually not making money by selling your product. You're making money by selling services on top of your product. So this is Space Monkey. I don't know if you know what it is, but it's a, uh, your own local cloud storage. Sits at your, somewhere in your home, right? Um, now, if you want to back up your data, you have to subscribe a monthly well, like subscription, right? So we're not only selling your very like hard drive, but we're also selling a service on top of that. So you're a recurring revenue. And then every investor loves if a customer brings a recurring revenue. Let's see what else is there. Um, there's hardmium, like freemium, but hardmium. So that means that um, hardware unlocks premium features of the product. This is Paper 53. It's a drawing app. And if you buy this pencil, this pencil is actually high tech. It's full of electronics. So if you draw with this pencil on a paper, it shows up on your computer screen. It's really cool. And this is the hardmium kind of type of business. So you unlock premium features buying hardware. There's also hardware as platform. So many um, hardware companies have figured out, so why should I do the hard work when somebody else can do the work for me? So this is Leap. So Leap is actually selling a platform. It has an open API. Everybody can develop applications on, on top of Leap and make money by developing these applications. Kind of similar like in, in, in an app store. And they just take like part of the revenue. 
And last but not least is hard data. So we already saw Nest earlier on, on the um, slide. So Nest is actually not selling you a thermostat. Everybody thinks Nest is a thermostat company. We're not. Nest is a data mining company. So what we actually do, we get your data, we analyze your habits, and we're making money by selling this data. So it's not selling. If Nest thermostat costs whatever, like $200. Probably it costs like 120 to manufacture, there's no money there. So we're actually gathering data and selling data. So it's a complete valid business model. And now if you think about looking at startups from investor pr perspective, so for us it's all about the traction. So if you're kind of trying to compare different companies, and if you would now try to put yourself into shoes of the investor, I don't know how much money you have in your bank account, but you can imagine investing half of it, or maybe two thirds of it, right? And now if a startup comes to you and they say that they have one million uni unique visitors, and it doesn't matter whether you're a hardware startup or a software startup, traction in early stages very often is measured how much traffic you get on your web page. Very often, because you have no other metric. This is the only metric you have, right? So either one million one-time unique visitors who stayed only for two seconds and never came back, or 500,000 who stayed for 10 seconds. By the way, 10, 10 seconds nowadays is huge. 10 seconds is a lot. If somebody stays on your web page more than 10 seconds, you have done good. Um, or maybe 200,000 who have actually clicked on something. So that your bounce rate is not that high. So, so many web pages have very high bounce rates, which means that you're targeting your customers wrong. So if your web page has a high bounce rate, that means people come on your web page, they realize this is not where what we were looking for, and they leave. So 2,000 who actually clicked on something, 200,000, sorry, or 20,000 who registered, maybe 2,000 who's like really passionate about you, tweet, Facebook, like, recommend to the friends, or 1,000 monthly subscribers. Right? So it's, it's not that easy. So now if you're looking from the investor perspective, where would you invest? Any like guesses? There's okay. Actually, actually there's, there, there are like no, no right answers. Uh, we think that this is where the money is. Because this is where you have potential for growth. Now, if you look at two companies, soft limited liability and hard limited liability companies. This is a, like quite typical, I wouldn't say typical, it's, it's um, a typical slide which you would see if you go to pitch competition. So today we're slush, uh, yesterday we were slush, where 100 companies get to pitch, 100 companies get to pitch on stage. And this is a typical like software startup pitch tech. Uh, we have steady user growth. Like any, any quarter we have like 250,000 new users. Seems like a great company, right? So the conversion rate is 4% on a monthly fee of $10 a year, right? So it's a very typical app company. Uh, sorry, very typical successful app company. Looks great, 1.5 million users. Now a hardware company comes and pitches at the same competition, right? 6,000 units, they sell 6,000 units on first quarter, and that was their Kickstarter campaign, right? 6,000 is fairly good. Now, sales drop. This is typically what happens after crowdfunding. And that's due to the fact that the people who are on the crowdfunding platforms aren't your real customers. So your sales will drop after you do a successful campaign, right? So 2,000 customers, 1,500, 2,500. Altogether, you have sold 12,000 units in a year. So now, looking from investor perspective, these numbers, 1.5 million or 12,000, which would you invest into? Why? We are not paying customers, only 4% conversion rate. But typical, 4% four, four conversion rate is actually even above average in... Hmm? I agree. Most of the most of the investors agree. Um, so this company is making 400k a year in revenue, but so does this one. And uh, 
this is what investors do not kind of see or they, they don't want to see. And that's why I actually have, I, that's not the first time I have this presentation. I mean, here it's the first time. But my job is kind, kind of to, I'm trying to convince investors it's okay to invest into hardware. You can actually make money. Just the point is that, of course, everybody likes like big numbers. 1.5 million is so much bigger than 12,000. But actually, you're making exactly the same amount of money in both of these two cases. So hardware is a cash flow business. What does that mean? Is that if you go into manufacturing, your money goes to working capital. So it's easier, yes, to build a hardware company. You still need a lot of money. You can prototype fairly easy. It doesn't cost anything. Well, it does cost something, but it's, it's fairly cheap. You can do small scale manufacturing. It doesn't also cost anything. But if you now go into large scale manufacturing, turns out that factories want you to pay before they actually start manufacturing for you. So you still need money, which goes into working capital. So if, even if you raise 500,000 euros, so for example, one of our mentors from Cube Sensors, it's, it's a, a fairly cool hardware startup from uh, Croatia. They raised 500,000 euros. For startup is a lot. In Hor Croatia, it's a lot of money. And 300,000 out of these 500 went into working capital. So it's on the shelves. It's in the components, right? So it kind of gives you an idea what, what the typical life cycle would look like. In a minimal viable product phase, anything 100, below 100K goes. You can build your minimal viable products. Um, doesn't need that much money. Uh, money comes from friends, family, and fools, or your own savings. Also accelerators invest in that stage. Later you go to de de design for manufacturing, which means this is where you start working with a factory. Money goes into molds, tooling, test benches. Money comes from pre-orders or angel and seed investment funds. Pre-orders meaning Kickstarter, right? And scaling, scaling is where you need already capital for more than 1 million euros. And that, by the way, mostly goes into marketing. And that sense, uh, hardware and software company are not that different. Uh, it's all about whether you can sell your product or not. So we follow uh, a lean investor model, which means that we do a lot of small investments into many companies, and we only do like follow-on investments into successful funds. So if we see that the company is not like doing well, we cut off the investments. Just like building a, a lean hardware, like lean startup, means that you iterate, you you push a product on a market, you see what's the reaction, and you take that into consideration and you push the next version on the market. So basically, we do the same, just from the investor investor perspective. Um, yeah, that's it. So we, we kind of try to filter out the failure as soon as possible. So if you look at the year 2014 and investments or exits in the world, there has been four big ex exits this world year. Um, I'm not going to ask you which ones. I'm going to tell you. Um, so Nest was bought by Google, Oculus Rift was bought by Facebook, and what was the last one? Uh, yeah, uh, Beats was bought by Apple. Who knows what's the biggest exit number four this year? WhatsApp. A ridiculous amount paid for nothing. But anyway, um, what my point is, uh, this year, free out of four largest exits globally are hardware. If you look 2012, I think there was no hardware exits. Uh, well, Microsoft bought Nokia, but that doesn't count. Uh, now, if, you, if you're trying to raise venture capital in hardware, uh, you have to remember these names here. These are the most active venture capital firms investing into hardware. There's not so many, I can tell you that. Remember the guys? I want to bring you a couple of uh, examples in, um, in w what investments have gone into the hardware. Uh, Quaya, interesting case, because they first went on Kickstarter, raised uh, 8.6 million, and after that went to the angels and raised another 20. And this is an interesting example, because it does work sometimes, that if you have good traction on Kickstarter, it's fairly easy to go and raise another round and say, I have 1,000 customers, all of them love me, uh, give me more money. So that's an example of that, how it happened. 
smart things have another very interesting example because Samsung bought them two years after they were founded. Two years. And bought them for 200 million euro, uh, dollars. Two years in a startup scene is a very short period of time. In a hardware company, it's damn short. And this is something which is happening right now a lot, is that large kind of uh, companies come and scout for the smaller ones, and they buy them in a very, very early stage. And last but not least is Sigfox. Does anybody, I, I think Gert knows who Sigfox is, but does anybody else know a company called Sigfox? It's a European company. Okay, no? They raised 32 million euros in Europe. In Europe, that's a lot of money uh, to be raised in Europe. What they do, it's, it's a French company. They build new IoT connection chips, so you can connect your device to, to the internet. It has power consumption of Bluetooth low energy, and that means it's a very little power com consumption, and it has a range of 20 kilometers. So, so this is a really cool company. Nobody knows about them, although they raised a ton of money. And, but why it's important is because uh, the most growth in coming years comes from machine to machine. So, so that's why I wanted to bring Sigfox as an example. So this is where the most growth is going to be. It's from machine to machine communication. Basically, it's the same thing which, which Gert was saying. So anyways, to wrap things up, so who, who we are here for accelerators? We're here for angel investors. Um, for angel investors, since angel investor invests his own money, that means he still has to work. So he doesn't have the time to go and talk to the startups to have a deal flow, whatever. So what accelerators do, they kind of uh, filter out the noise and give like the final selection to the angels. Or for venture capital firms, venture capital firms usually don't invest right after the accelerator. But they, what venture capital fi firms want to see, since accelerators work with companies at grassroot level, you see where the future is going to be. You see that through application, you see where, what kind of like, companies people want to build, and this is what's going to happen in two or three years. And this is why venture capital works with um, accelerators, large company, large technology firms, we want to acquire you. Very often it's, they do not buy your product, they buy you as a team. This happens very, very often. For example, Crapcad. Crapcad made an exit, everybody hopefully knows that Crapcad made an exit. 100 million euro exit. Do you think that Hardy uh, cashed out? No, he's now working for Stratasys. Uh, other startup founders, there's many founders who would like to start up, but they don't have the courage. So we can kind of bring them together with uh, teams and service providers. Crowdfunding, CDRS, Hoandia, uh, and Altium. And that's it. That's it. Uh, yeah, and uh, say, uh, my sales pitch, yeah, we're taking applications. If you know anyone who is uh, building a hardware product would like to maybe uh, accelerate their uh, uh, growth or get some funding, uh, send them to our direction. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions or, I mean, if you have questions, you can come. Okay. Yes, uh, come and talk to me if you have any questions. Thank you, guys.